Hello everyone, welcome back to the workshop. Thanks for tuning in. Today we're going to be doing a little bit different of a how to forge. We're going to be taking the wrought iron, which is on the right, and this 1084 on the left, and butt welding them together to create a broken back sax. These are both 10 millimeter thick pieces. The wrought iron is uh, 25 millimeters wide or an inch wide, and the 1084 is approximately 16 millimeters uh, or about 5 eighths. So, we're using uh, low hydrogen rods to weld this together uh, so that the tensile strength is going to be enough that we're not going to lose the billet off the bar. I often use a uh, high tensile, low hydrogen weld for my billets, or sometimes I'll use a dissimilar electrode, which is a stainless variant. Now we're going into the forge while it's still warming up, so the billet can come up to temperature with the forge, and I didn't film the first flux but I did flux it before we came to this. It was just with a uh, standard glitz green borax from my local hardware store. When we're welding, we want to put the wrought iron on the anvil first because we want to make sure that the heat is getting sucked out of the larger piece and not the smaller. In this case, it's not super uh, important, but every heat, we're also going to flux it so that make sure that we close up any uh, weld space and we're just going to keep forging from the 1084 side uh, because the hammer will move the wrought iron much faster than the 1084 because the 1084 with that higher carbon and higher alloy content doesn't move as much under the hammer even at a high heat. So the wrought iron will move less being in contact with the anvil. You'll notice that my blows are quite rapid uh, and even, and I'm working from one end to the other. Obviously, you know, I can't work side to side because it's quite thin, but uh, I'm not working the sides until I get that weld truly secure, which takes about three to four welding cycles uh, at a full welding heat, and then I'm going to start drawing it out. So with the uh, billet properly welded together, I'm fairly confident of the weld. At this point, I'm going to start thinking about working it down into a, uh, the thickness of bar I want and drawing that material out. Uh, at this point, the, during the heat, you should be able to see as it cools any uh, delamination if the uh, steel or the wrought iron cools faster than one another uh, along the seam. That means that you haven't got a successful weld, but as you can see here, the bar is all one homogeneous color. And now I'm going to use the straight pin, uh, and I'm working from both sides down the length. Uh, and I'm also going to be creating a little bit of a distal taper from the very end that's attached to the handle down to the tip of the billet. Uh, and that's going to be helpful when we come to the preform of the knife. It's just going to save us a little time. Then we'll do a couple cycles of this, and we'll be able to cut the tip in. Nothing will quite test your welds like drawing out the uh, material with a very heavy blows along the line of the forge weld. So if at any point your forge weld wasn't secure, at this point is when it'll split. Fortunately, I didn't get any splitting and was able to draw this out to a nice uh, even distal taper. And I about got uh, an extra third uh, material length.
you can start to see uh, as I flatten this out that distal taper that I was intending for uh, when actually then going to start a flat taper on the other way uh, in on the width going from the handle section to the tip of the billet and that is because uh, broken back saxes specifically are actually thickest at or widest at their uh, point behind the point. So the uh, at the top of the peak of the clip point uh, is actually its widest point. So it actually tapers back down to the handle. Uh, it actually tapers away from the guard and then down to the point again. Uh, it pays to be careful to forge mostly from the steel side when you're forging these billets because the more forging you do on the wrought iron side, uh, as with the welding cycles, the wrought iron will move a lot more than the steel. So you need to make sure that you're moving the material mostly from the steel side. Um, you don't want to thin out your wrought iron a little bit too much and then you'll end up with an off-center seam, and you want the wrought iron for its character, so the more uh, surface area you can give that on the side of the blade, the better. And uh, we're just going to keep working that taper in. Again, we're working a distal taper and also a flat taper, but in this case the flat taper is coming back towards our stock hand rather than uh, away from it like we would normally do with uh, any other style of knife. Pay attention to the uh, area where the steel meets the wrought iron uh, at the back near the handle. That little cold shut there is going to come back and bite us later. But you can see that nice distal taper and the flat taper as well. We're going to work that in just a little bit more. We're going to do it down the length of the anvil to try and keep everything a little bit flatter and straighter. Uh, but yeah, we're going <laughs> to we're going to regret having that. Uh, 1084 be just a little bit shorter than the wrought iron. Uh, in the future, if I was to do this again, I would make sure that they're both exactly the same length. And it pays to keep your forgings as clean as you can. Uh, so, you know, keep the scale off the anvil. Nice rapid blows. And uh, work it right down to a red heat before you put it back in the forge. Something to pay attention to, of course, is that wrought iron is very granular and uh, does have a grain to it full of slag and impurities and will split on you occasionally so you'll end up with a uh, you'll end up with a couple of delaminations occasionally and it does happen on this bar a couple of times uh, it's not uh, it's to be expected you don't have to worry about it too much just bring it up to a welding heat put a little flux on it and hammer it away and it'll normally disappear pretty quickly if you move the material at too low a heat, uh, if you try and do too much moving rather than planishing or bending, you will get d -land.
So now we're just going to cut the tip in. Uh, it pays to pay a very close attention to which side the 1084 is on, because obviously you don't want to cut uh, the tip on with the 1084 being on the spine side of the tip. Uh, so I, I did almost scare myself for a minute after I threw this back in the forge, not sure which side it was, uh, which is a good sign for the forge weld, but it was a terrible sign for if I'd cut it the wrong way. Uh, I'm cutting all the way through from one side. You Cutting through from both sides when you're cutting on an angle is quite difficult. And you can see here that it did open up just a little bit of a uh, flaw in the wrought iron. That's not actually a flaw between the 1084 and the, uh, the wrought iron. That's just in the wrought iron. Uh, we're going to be careful about cutting it off. We don't want to cut into our hammer face with the wrought hot cut. And this will put some stress on that tip weld, so if the welds aren't good, that tip would have split from the wrought iron, but luckily we didn't get any. I went it for a welding heat to just close up that uh, little D-lam in the wrought iron, and then we're going to work the tip back a little bit, sharpen the point. Uh, the angle obviously uh, wants to be a little bit more obtuse than what it is, but... Uh, we can always do that with a forging rather than cutting. I prefer to cut off as little material as I can, especially when I'm working with a rare material like wrought iron that can be quite expensive these days. Uh, and as you can see, hopefully the taper goes from the stock where the bar is welded on out to that peak where the point is, and then the it tapers back down to the point, and that's the, the traditional sax taper. Forging in the point like this will also put a lot of stress on your uh, welds, so if you find that it is splitting at this point, it's a really good idea to try and chase that out with some welding heats. Uh, sometimes it, the billet will just fail and you'll have to start again. Um, you know, that that is the nature of working with wrought iron, uh, especially. But I was lucky in this case that uh, I didn't have that. You'll notice at this point that we're actually starting to get a little bit of a, a curve to the point rather than that clean, straight uh, edge point that we want for a sax, but that's not actually a bad thing because when we come to forging the bevels, that's actually going to push that tip out a little bit more. And uh, if we had a straight line at this point, it would become a recessed curve or a concave uh, and will look more like a buoy point. So having that little bit of extra curve in the tip is going to help us. And now that we've got our tip established, I thought it was just a little bit too tall for what I wanted. You've got to remember that preform is incredibly important when you're making uh, any kind of knife. The overall dimensions of the preform are going to dictate the final dimensions of the piece. Uh, now, if your material, in this case, my material is eight millimeters thick at the where the tank shoulder is going to be, and it tapers down to around about five and a half to six millimeters at the tip. Uh, it's quite chunky at this point. We're probably going to get a quarter of an inch to uh, three eighths of an inch of uh, width out of the bevels. And so if the piece is 40 millimeter high, then you're gonna end up with a 50 millimeter high blade. And uh, you know, saxes tend to be a little bit narrower than that. So we want to make sure that it's narrow in the form. And much like with the Continental Sax, which is also in the playlist, you're going to uh, cut in the spine notch. Now I made the mistake of cutting in the notch a little bit too deep um, because it's on the wrought iron side. And again, the wrought iron moves a lot more than the 1084. So uh, it would have paid to just make a smaller notch in that. If you were making this out of mono steel, uh, all of these steps are exactly the same. You want to preform the blank uh, with the both tapers, both width and uh, in distal taper. Uh, but then when you cut these notches in, it would be less of an issue. You could treat it much like the continental sax. And once we have the rear notch in, we're going to use a block of wood and the anvil to curve towards the edge. This is one of the only times where I'll do this. And the reason I'm using the block of wood instead of uh, like an, an anvil block or something like that is because that will cut notches into the spine, whereas the wood won't. And the reason I'm doing it this way rather than trying to forge from the top over the horn is because then you'd be putting direct pressure on that tip, 
which would make it want to shear. You'd want to shear that material. So using the, the wider anvil face and then forging inside the curve uh, from the steel side means that you're less likely to shear your weld as you go. And so now I'm just planishing out that spine to give us just that little bit of extra curve in the edge. And that'll guarantee that when we bevel, it's going to come out straight. And that point is going to come out as that nice uh, broken back sax point. I apologize for not uh, having it on f in frame for the first few blows. But uh, forging the bevels are done exactly the same as the bevel tang continental sax that I did earlier in the, uh, the series. I'm working from the heel at this point, not trying to create a plunge cut because the tang itself will be beveled. So we're just going to work this out. Now in this case, uh, you'll notice that unlike the Continental Sax, I didn't forge the tang out to final dimension, and that was because I was very aware of that uh, shear line in the tang from where the steel was overlapped by the wrought iron. And we're going to have to deal with that once we've finished forging the blade out. But for now, we're going to use our uh, my English Cutlass Hammer, which is my favorite hammer, to uh, forge these bevels out. And this is going to be a full flat ground blade, so it's going to have a bevel all the way from the spine down to the edge. That doesn't mean that we want to forge all the way from the spine down to the edge. We actually want to make sure that we're forging from no further than three quarters of the way up the blade uh, down to the edge and leaving a little bit of a flat at the top, because that means that we're going to maintain our spine thickness uh, and, give, and maintain that distal taper. If we cut into the spine a little bit too much, then we're going to thin the blade out completely, and that's going to ruin our overall uh, cross-section. So we've got to the tip here, and uh, you'll notice that the material bulged a little bit in the middle and that the tip is no longer the highest point in the blade. And that we can fix that, but we need to do it before the bevel is completely forged. So in the next heat, while the edge is still relatively thick, I'm going to come back in and bring that rearward taper back in and isolate that spike point, that, that really nice sharp transition from the spine to the point taper. And you again, you want to do this while the edge is relatively thick so that it can stand up to the abuse of being forged on. If you do this after you forge the bevels completely to thickness, then you're going to end up with uh, a wrinkly and rolled over edge, which no one, no one likes. Just uh, delineating that transition between the point taper and the rearward taper of the blade. This is a really bad time uh, in the forging that could go wrong, that you could get a split in the weld, and it's almost impossible to fix at this point. Um, if you're forging this out of mono steel, this step it goes as easily as forging the point on anything else.
So, we're gonna hot cut off, and I'm actually trying to hot cut right at the, uh, section where the bad Forge World happened, or actually it wasn't a bad Forge World, it was where the 1084 cut into the wrought iron. Unfortunately, I didn't cut back far enough, and so we're gonna find out that, uh, that Tang section is going to be a little bit difficult, but that's gonna give me an opportunity to show you how I fix certain mistakes. Uh, the second mistake I made was uh, doing exactly opposite of what I was talking about earlier when forging uh, from uh, forging the wrought iron backed steel. Uh, normally you would want to put the wrought iron on the anvil and forge from the steel side, but when it came to this section, I was actually deepening the rear tang notch by forging with the tang notch on the anvil face. So I'd actually be better served forging from the tang notch from the wrought iron side down onto the anvil face like this uh, because that actually makes the wrought iron move less funnily enough than if i did it the opposite way around and i wouldn't deepen that tang notch normally i don't want that deep of a tang notch on my uh, on my blades the continental sax again i refer back to that uh, has a better demonstration of how to cut in a tang uh, in this case I had a severe difficulty trying to get a edge notch, the edge tang notch, uh, cut into this because every time I tried, I would end up forging onto the wrought iron. And you can see that that split has opened up where the wrought iron has overtaken the 1084 um, from where we originally had the weld. Uh, and so I used a welding heat to try and close it up, but uh, it just didn't close. But that's okay, because I was planning on welding on a tang extension on this anyway, because I didn't quite have enough material to make a full-length tang for a through-tang construction. So uh, what we're going to do instead is we're going to cut that material off, and I'm going to weld on a tang extension. And I'll show you how to do that in a minute. Before we get to that though, of course, I'm going to bevel the tang. I'm going to get all of the tang geometry set out properly. Um, even with that split in it, I'm just going to ignore that split and just act like it's not there for this period. And I'm going to get the, uh, the geometry correct. Again, I tried to cut in the uh, tang shoulder. And uh, yeah, it, that, that didn't go very well. <laughs> Uh, in this case, I, it would have been better to just leave it uh, full thickness and then grind or file that in at a later date. Um, as you can see here, I go to cut it in using the standard technique uh, that I used for the continental sacks. And uh, unfortunately, all I did was manage to deepen the tang notch on the wrought iron side because wrought iron moves like butter, whereas 1084 does not. So. That's my bad, I left it at that point so because I knew that I could grind a central tang that was still going to be thick enough to withstand abuse uh, from that material and, uh, you know, just caught it a lost cause at this point. But it is something to note for the future. And a final low heat, just to uh, do some adjustments to the blade, straighten it all out, make it easier to uh, finish up when we're done. Uh, we are going to be reheating this blade after we weld on the tang extension anyway, but this just means that we can have an opportunity to dress our geometry. You can see that we've got a nice full flat, almost, uh, grind going on uh, out of the forging. Bevels are nice and clean, keep the anvil clean, keep the hammer moving, we forge at those low temperatures with light blows, the planishing blows. And there you have it. That is the final forged piece for now. So we just take an angle grinder to it and nip that nasty piece off. And then we're going to take it to the grinder 
and grind the tang shoulders in, make it up even, and we're also going to bevel the end of the tang ready for welding. Uh, now obviously this is a how to forge series, not normally a how to grind series, but uh, I figured that this is an important step to show you how to fix mistakes. Uh, it is said of uh, Craftsman that it's not that the master makes any less mistakes than his apprentice, it is simply that he knows how to fix them. So I figured if I'm teaching you how to forge these things, I should also teach you how to fix them when they go bad, because they do. Again, I wouldn't normally have tank shoulders this deep uh, on a blade like this, but uh, unfortunately, due to the forging, that's the way it is. It's still way thick enough uh, and wide enough to withstand most abuse. And again, we're going to use low hydrogen rods because we're welding to wrought iron uh, and to high carbon steel, and that's going to improve the tensile strength of the weld so that that tang material is not going to come off. Now you'll notice I'm using quarter inch by inch mild steel. I beveled the end of it so that the weld can fill that fillet. Uh, and then we're actually going to forge this uh, again and forge out the tang completely. And that's also going to thermal cycle the weld, which means that we're going to remove that heat affected zone around the weld itself. I'm just going to nip off what I believe to be enough material for the tang. More than enough, really. And then we're going to go back and forge it. And we're just going to forge it like it was a standard piece of the material originally. Tang extensions are by no means a sign of a bad craftsman. Uh, I know several mastersmiths that have done tang extension weld-ons. Uh, many people weld on thread for when they do pommel nuts and stuff like that. As long as the weld is not right across the shoulders where the guard is going to meet the blade, which could be a weak, weak point, uh, generally speaking, you're not going to see uh, much stress inside the handle material, especially if it's mounted properly. So I'm not worried about that uh, welded section in the middle of the handle. Uh, and like I said, given the original amount of material that I had access to, I was still going to have to weld on a tanning extension. This just meant it just ended up being a little longer than I expected. But um, as you'll notice, given the uh, high tensile strength of the weld, and also because I'm thermal cycling it during the forging, um, that weld is holding up fine. It's not splitting, it's not cracking. If I did notice that it was splitting and cracking, I may go back and replace the uh, low hydrogen rod with a dissimilar metal rod uh, to try and improve the contact between the wrought iron and the mild steel. Because wrought iron with all its slag and impurities tends to leave uh, pretty nasty weld slag behind and uh, that can inhibit welding. Now, uh, for those of you who want to forge a broken back sax from uh, mono steel, from standard stock, uh, all of the steps are the same. You may not have to weld on a tang extension, hopefully you don't. Uh, but yeah, all of the steps for forging the profile are the same. Again, make sure that you're paying attention to preform. And uh, if you're interested in forging a broken back sax, I highly suggest you look at my forging a continental sax video, which shows you how to forge uh, most of the tank components and, and that kind of thing uh, in more detail out of mono steel rather than with this tank construction. They are basically the same. The main difference comes down to the point, which is why I added that little extra flair of uh, forge welding the wrought iron to the 1084, because it is a more traditional construction method, uh, although most of the time they would uh, use various forms of wrought iron or uh, pattern welded steel as the spine bars. But uh, yeah, I came out really nice. So um, we can see that the tang shoulders are a little deeper and sharper than they would be on forging, but we have that nice distal taper. We also have the vertical taper from the tang shoulders to the delineation point between the main blade and the point. It doesn't have to be extreme. It only has to be very subtle. Some of the traditional uh, 
Viking finds and Anglo-Saxon finds were uh, a little bit more extreme than this version, but it came out quite nicely. Thanks for watching. So there you go, guys. How to forge a wrought iron-backed, brick-backed sack. Now, these are technically Anglo-Saxon, as I said earlier, and uh, they don't always have wrought iron backs in historical builds. Sometimes they had, uh, you know, twisted uh, forms of steel, uh, Damascus steel, quote unquote, pattern welded steel. Um, it did depend on the maker and obviously the access to materials that they had. Now, obviously, as I said before, if you are using mono steel, then you don't have a lot of the uh, limitations that you do when you have a forge welded body. I wanted to show how to uh, manipulate a forge welded body in this instance because it's a little different to manipulating other kinds of forge welded bodies. Um, and I'm glad, I'm kind of glad that I ended up having to show you how to weld on a tang extension because it does happen. Uh, you know, tangs get stuffed up, uh, bad things happen, and it's not about the fact that you screwed up, it's about how you fix it. So I'm really glad I had the opportunity to show you how I would go about fixing that. Uh, this obviously is going to be a through tang construction like the traditional historical models, so uh, having that extra long tang is, is necessary. Uh, if it was going to be a hidden tang, I probably would have only welded on a tang stub. Um, but anyway, with that being said, hope you enjoyed the video. If you want to see more like this video, then make sure to hit that subscribe button and uh, make sure to hit the bell notification icon to be notified when I upload new videos. I have several others in this series so far and I have more planned. If you have a specific kind of knife that you want to see me make, or if you have a particular kind of construction method that you want to see me make, uh, please leave that comment down in the comment section below. Also, uh, if you want to help support this channel and help me make more awesome content just like this, feel free to join this list of wonderful people, my patrons who allow me to make this kind of content and improve the uh, audio quality, the video quality, keep my gas in my forge, the hammer in my hand, and uh, keep me able to make this kind of content for you guys. With that being said, I'm going to jump off now. I hope you have a fantastic day. I'll be live on Saturday. I always am. I'll see you then. Bye.